On today's Locked on Jayhawks, previewing KU football's game, their regular season finale at Cincinnati. You are Locked on Jayhawks, your daily podcast on the Kansas Jayhawks, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Derek Johnson. You can hear me as well Monday through Friday from 3 to 6 p.m. on KLW and Lawrence with Rock Chalk Sports Talk. Thanks for making Locked on Jayhawks your first listen every day. We are free and available anywhere you get your podcasts and on our YouTube page where you can like and subscribe to the show. And uh, on today's edition of the show, we're talking KU Cincinnati regular season finale for the KU football team. We're going to finish with their eighth win of the season. First, though, this episode of the show is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On College for twenty dollars off your first purchase with Game Time. This is a one-to-one series. These two teams met for a home and home back in the nineties. Each of them won at home, so I guess KU trying to get their first ever win in Cincinnati. And uh, as far as the top storylines coming into this game, because you know on paper KU comes in at seven and four and. Um, Cincinnati comes in at three and eight, right? There's not a lot of like national headlines for what's at stake in this game, but I think there are a lot of local headlines for the two teams. Um, it's obviously the regular season finale. So, you know, for some players, this could be, uh, your final opportunity. Like for Cincinnati, this is senior day and, um, this obviously not going to be in a bowl game. This will be their final game of the season for Kansas. It's a regular season finale chance to kind of stamp what has been a good regular season, but one that if you lose this one, you lose your final three feels I don't, I don't know it, like it still would be a good season and everything but it would feel like you limp to the finish line again similar to last year and then you maybe start having questions about okay why does this keep happening year over year so finish strong go out with a good taste in your mouth and trying to get that bad taste out of your mouth from last week with Kansas State I think that becomes an interesting storyline in this one you know um in the same way that it is difficult to come off a big win and the next week get up to the same level that you were it is very difficult when you come off an emotional rivalry loss in a game that you felt like you should have won and was an excruciating loss for you and get back up for the next week. So that's going to be the challenge for KU. Emotionally, if they can get there, I like them in this game. But that is a question of how you do emotionally. I think in the uh, Iowa State game, they passed that emotional test. Again, different side of it. After the win over Oklahoma, they were able to get back up at Iowa State. But in the at Nevada game, they nearly lost that game. And that was uh, more of an emotional side of like the travel schedule and some of the other stuff they had to deal with. And that one didn't go as well. So what is this game going to be at Tennessee? Uh, I think a big storyline for Kansas here, they, they still have an opportunity at nine wins if they can win this one and the bowl game. And why is that important? Usually 10 is kind of like the benchmark number, uh, right? Six is the bowl number. Seven is the winning season number. 10 is the benchmark number. And then you have you know stuff after that. Why is nine important for KU? Well, besides the Orange Bowl season, when Kansas went 12 and one in the 2007 season, finished with the 08 Orange Bowl. The last time that Kansas won nine games in a season before that was 1995 when they won 10 games and won the Aloha Bowl. The previous time they won nine games before the 95 season, which they won the Aloha Bowl, you have to go all the way back to 1968. So basically, when you look at the history of this program over the last 50 years, 50, I don't know, two years, three years, four years, whatever, over the last 50 plus years of KU football-ish, you have only had two nine-win seasons. So you have an opportunity to do something that doesn't happen very often in Lawrence. And ideally, with Lance Leipold and where this program is going, you want this to be a more normal thing, that winning nine games isn't as big of a deal, that it's, okay, that's a good season again, but we're used to those, right? That'd be the ideal way. But right now, you're not used to it, right? So winning nine games would still be a very big deal for this program. You have to win this game to have that opportunity to do so. And in fact, Kansas has only won se- uh, seven games in a season 22 times. You've obviously already accomplished that, and that includes this year. Uh, that number drops to just 12 times in program history in which they've won eight games. So even if you just win one of your final two, which you can get done in this one, it would just be the 13th time in program history you have won eight games. So that would be reason to celebrate. And they've only won nine or more games five times in program history. So that number would still represent a huge benchmark for this program and for the Lance Leipold era if you can get it but you got to win this one and then win the bowl game. Uh, The other storyline here is how does this game affect what bowl KU gets into? You know, the Alamo Bowl probably off the table after you lose to Kansas State. Obviously, no New Year's Six Bowl going to happen, anything like that. Um, I'd imagine at best you could maybe still squeeze into the Pop-Tart Bowl. You would have to win this game, your path to the Pop-Tart Bowl. You'd have to win this one, get to eight and four. And then what you would need is 
um, both Texas and Oklahoma to get into New Year's Six Bowls, whether you know Texas in the playoff or just a New Year's Six, Oklahoma to get into New Year's Six, which they're right, you know, kind of on the fray of doing. Um, and then that way, the Alamo Bowl, who has the first selection beyond the New Year's Six, could be like, okay, we'll take Oklahoma State or we'll take Kansas State. And then you would just have to hope the Pop Dart Bowl takes you over Kansas State or Oklahoma State, which on paper you might say, well, why would they do that? Oklahoma State and Kansas State, you know, they're ranked higher and they beat KU straight up. Again, we saw in the Liberty Bowl last year, it's not always based on standing. It's also partially based on who do you think we can get a good turnout for and good storylines about, right? And, and maybe that is Oklahoma State. Maybe that is Kansas State. I don't know, but that would be kind of dependent. And sometimes it's dependent on the relationships you build. Pop-Tart Bowl people were out for the Oklahoma games. That was probably a good first impression you made on them. So if you win this game, you still have an outside shot of it. I don't know that it's the betting favorite necessarily. Best bet might be the Texas Bowl or going back to the Liberty Bowl. Um, if you there, – there's still a chance, too, you could be in the guaranteed rate bowl, which has been an increasingly popular selection. I mean, if Nebraska beats Iowa this this week, I keep circling that and being like, yeah, they would probably love to have Kansas play Nebraska because that would probably get good TV rating, especially kind of in the local Midwest market. Um, so we'll see. If they lose this game, you're probably for sure looking at guaranteed rate or armed forces bowl, something like that. If you win, yeah, I think anywhere between Pop-Tart, Texas, Liberty, and guaranteed rate all becomes probabilities with different levels of probabilities there. Uh, the other big storyline here is who's going to be the quarterback, right? I mean, you look at Kansas and um, Jason Bean sounds like he's been practicing, getting reps and everything. My assumption as of recording is that he's going to be the guy, but that's just an assumption. And this entire season we've been assuming and guessing, and sometimes we've been wrong, sometimes we've been right. So it is what it is. Um, I, I think it is interesting to point out that Cole Ballard, if they want to redshirt him, could not play in this game because he's played in four games now. Now, theoretically, Cole Ballard next year, you'd have Jalen Daniels back. You'd have Isaiah Marshall coming in. You could theoretically say, okay, our plan next year is to have Cole Ballard. Hopefully, he doesn't have to play in more than four games, and we can redshirt him next year, and then it'll be fine anyway, right? But if they do want to do that, maybe the idea is, hey, we'll start Jason Bean, and hopefully he can stay healthy and play the whole game, and that way we can reserve a Cole Ballard redshirt. Jalen Daniels can also play in this game and still reserve a redshirt. That was pointed out by Lance Leipold. Was that just kind of throwing a grenade into the media and being like, here, talk about this. Or is that a real possibility? He did dress out for the Kansas State game and was there uh, in warmups in uniform. So um, uh, my expectation is it's going to be Bean with a backup of Ballard, but I guess we don't really know with the KU quarterback uh, carousel. Not the normal carousel where it's like, you know, normally you say quarterback carousel and it's like, oh, this guy's not playing well. And then that guy came in and he wasn't playing well. It's quarterback carousel for different reasons, but nonetheless one anyway. As far as the Cincinnati scouting report, they are 81st in the country on ESPN's SP+. Plus, So they haven't been too hot this year, just 3-8 and eight on the season. Uh, they're last in the Big 12. They have wins over Eastern Kentucky, FCS school, Pittsburgh, who has been really bad in the ACC. And uh, then at Houston, one of the new schools to the Big 12, who's done okay so far this year. Uh, but won't be in a bowl game, I guess, unless some uh, not enough eligible bowl teams. Anyway, though, uh, they did have close losses to UCF. They had close losses to Baylor. They had close losses to BYU, Miami of Ohio, who's a really good team in the MAC, and they had a close-ish loss to Oklahoma. It was like twenty to six. So they've been a much better home team, and that's the challenge here. You're playing them on the road. It's difficult to play on the road in college football. They have been better at home, and it's Senior Day for them. Offensively, for Cincinnati, they're ranked ninety sixth in the country on ESPN SB Plus. Uh, their Big 12 ranks 11th in scoring, 6th in total yards per game, 8th in yards per play, 5th in yards per rush, and ninth in yards per pass attempt. So pretty good rushing attack, uh, average to below average offense in the Big 12. Emory Jones is the quarterback. He's a dual threat, about 2,100 passing, 500 rushing, 22 total touchdowns. That becomes a challenge because we've seen KU at times through the last couple of years with the, the uh, Lance Leipold there struggle against dual threat quarterbacks and allow that to be a problem. Corey Kiner has a, uh, I don't know if he's related to former KU uh, running back Keon Kiner. I, I don't think so. Is that Keon Kinner? Anyway, uh, Corey Kiner has been a really good running back for Cincinnati. 941 yards, 5.4 yards per carry. He's a dude. Xavier Henderson has 752 receiving yards. Um, they've got another good slot receiver too. So they have some skill talent there. They can make you miss with the ball in their hands, uh, but they have struggled in pass blocking, 85th in the country in pass block grade, helps to have a dual threat quarterback there. They have given up a lot of sacks though, uh, but they're 38th in run blocking grade. So again, better running team than they are a passing team, but they still have some skill players to make you make you hurt on the outside. Defensively, they're ranked 71st on ESPN's SB+. Plus. Uh, in Big 12 ranks, they are 11th in scoring defense, 7th in total yards allowed per game, 12th in yards allowed per play, 13th in yards allowed per rush. 
that certainly gets some alarm bells going off. And 11th in yards allowed per pass attempt. Deshaun Pace is kind of like the safety linebacker hybrid, makes a ton of plays for them. Really good player. Dante Corleone might be the best interior defensive lineman in the Big 12 and one of the best in the country, the godfather with Dante Corleone. He is unbelievable as, as both a pass rusher, disruptor, a run defender. And really their entire front is, is tough to, to go against. Uh, but despite all, all that and some of those good players, they are bottom four in the league in both sacks and interceptions. They haven't made a ton of chaotic plays. They are 82nd on pro football focus in tackling grade. They are 42nd in pass rush grade, so they've been good there, and 114th in coverage grade, so they've really struggled on the back end. Special teams-wise, 54th on ESPN SB+. Kicker's been elite so far. They're number one in the Big 12 in field goal percentage and PAT percentage. Uh, they're also third in net yards per punt. So the specialists, the kickers, the punters have been good, but they have not been very good at return game. They're last in the Big 12 in yards per kick return and punt return. Let's get to our matchups of the game. Players to watch, Hawks to soar in this one of Locked on Jayhawks. We're brought to you by eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience. What brings home the winning trophy is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. From superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more, whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has got you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back because with ebay motors you're burning rubber not cash with all the parts you need at the prices you want it's easy to turn your car into the mvp and bring home that dub keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com eligible items only exclusions apply ebay guaranteed fit only available to u.s customers Matchups of the game, we start with first down, the running offense for both teams against the running defense. So Kansas is second in the Big 12 in yards per carry. They're averaging 5.2 yards per carry. They have, uh, you know, the, the great dynamic duo of Devin Neal, who that was a joke. He was left off the uh, Doak Walker semifinalist or finalist, whatever it was, list. Um, he deserved to be on there. And um, he's been unbelievable. Among like the top 20 rushers in the country in total yards, He's like second in yards per carry. It's not his fault. They play at a slower pace offensively in their balanced offense, and they rotate another really good running back in there too. He is one of the, the five or ten best running backs in the country, and that was uh, a shame. Uh, I know Notre Dame fans are up in it too because Estime, uh, their guy, is unbelievable. He'll have more years to win it because he's just a freshman, but still. Uh, anyway, Kansas at 5.2 yards per carry. Cincinnati is fifth in the conference at 5.0 yards per carry, so two good running offenses in this one. Meanwhile, KU defensively is eighth in yards allowed per carry. That's been a nice improvement for them from last year. So they've been decent at it, but that still puts them about middle of the pack in the conference. Cincinnati is only 13th in the Big 12 in yards allowed per carry. They have struggled in that area defensively. So Kansas should be able to run the football well in this game and kind of grind them into the pulp. And that's a good recipe to go on the road and get a win. Uh, both teams have backs that are going to make you miss with Kiner, Neal, Highshaw. Uh, obviously, Cincinnati has the mobile quarterback that can kind of add to that too. KU's quarterbacks can run, whether it's Bean or we've seen Ballard. I mean, Ballard had 50 rushing yards last week, had a couple big runs against Kansas State too. So um, the running game is going to be the first big matchup here. Second down, Kansas hitting big bat pass plays working off play action and off the run. Kansas is, is seventh in the Big 12 in completion percentage. So they're about an average, you know, completion rate team in the Big 12. But they're third in yards per pass attempt, over nine yards per pass attempt. They're, they're right there behind first. First, second, and third are all above nine, and they're all stacked together. So it's really these top three. I think it's Oklahoma, UCF, and then uh, Kansas is in at number third. So um, they're a team, which basically what that means is they're not – always completing a high percentage of passes, but when they are, they're hitting big plays, right? So if you're averaging a lot of yards, but you're not completing the most passes. And that's kind of in line with Cincinnati defensively. Cincinnati defensively is second in the league in completion percentage against, but they're 11th in yards allowed per pass. So Cincinnati's defense doesn't give up a lot of completions, but when they do, they tend to go for bigger plays, meaning that if Kansas is hitting big plays and Cincinnati struggles giving up some of those big plays in passing games, that could be a good recipe for this game, especially when you look at Cincinnati struggling and run defense. Kansas could run the ball well and then really be set up to hit some big plays in the play action passing game and downfield, especially if it's Jason Bean. He throws a really good deep ball downfield. That's what I'm on the lookout for, that Kansas could hit a couple big pass plays in this game to break it open. Third down, Kansas pass rush versus the Cincinnati offensive line. Cincinnati quarterbacks have been sacked 25 times this season. That is the second most of any team in the Big 12. 
Kansas on the defensive side of the football has 26 sacks. That is the second most of any defense in the Big 12. So you have one of the best sacking teams led by Austin Booker and Jeremy Robinson and uh, the occasional blitz from like Craig Young or J.B. Brown versus one of the offensive lines that has struggled most in pass blocking and, and um, a team that has been sacked the second most in the Big 12. Kansas should be able to get pressure. You need to get at least two or three sacks in this game to take advantage of that. And any more is a cherry on top. Fourth down. Fourth down play. We're just going to stick right there. Uh, Cincinnati is fifth in the Big 12 in most fourth down attempts. So they go for it at a decent amount of time. But they're only 12th in fourth down percentage. So they go for it a decent amount, but they haven't had a ton of success at it so far this season. Kansas, meanwhile, is second to last in the Big 12. So one of the bottom two in fourth down attempts and fourth down percentage on their offensive side of the ball, meaning Cincinnati is going for a lot, not converting a lot. Kansas is not going for a lot. They're also not converting a lot. But both Kansas and Cincinnati defensively rank in the bottom three in the Big 12 and fourth down defense by conversion percentage against. So both defenses have been susceptible to this. Which offense can take advantage more of it? If it's a wash, I think that favors KU. Right, This is a game where maybe Cincinnati, if they go three of four on fourth down or something, that's one avenue for them maybe pulling off the upset. I'll add a quick bonus one here. Neither offense has been great in the red zone, and both defenses have been uh, have struggled a bit in the red zone to this point. So that could be something to watch out for, which team, team can take more advantage uh, in the red zone. We've seen KU have a couple struggles there offensively in the past couple weeks uh, in red zone offense. Player matchup, we're going to go Mellow Dotson slash Kobe Bryant versus Xavier Henderson. Uh, whoever's lined up on him. Henderson is Cincinnati's leading receiver. 54 catches, 752 yards, and three touchdowns. For what it's worth, they've got a really good slot receiver in uh, Smith who has 40 catches for 542 yards and four touchdowns, mostly operating in the slot. Um, so he might that, – that'll be an interesting matchup, whether KU puts a Kalen Gervin or a safety on him or Craig Young or whoever. Right? But on the outside, Henderson, really good player. And outside of those two with Henderson and Smith, Cincinnati has – which Henderson and Smith, that's about – 1300 receiving yards from the two of them combined the rest of cincinnati has 1103 yards so it's basically their passing offense is those two guys so if you take one of them out it becomes a huge problem for their passing offense mellow dotson this year has a 65 nfl passer rating against that is fantastic uh he continues to stay on a roll get all these interceptions here in the back end of the season kobe bryant has been just targeted 31 times this season, which is incredible through uh, 11 games. He has a 73.2 NFL passer rating against. That's really good too. And that's even without getting the chances for the bunch of picks to lower that you know NFL passer rating like Melo Dotson's had the opportunity to do. So if one of those guys or both of them, depending where they line up and, and how they approach it, can take Henderson out of the game, it could be tough sledding for the Cincinnati offense. All right, we're going to finish up here with Hawks, the sore players we think can stand out for the KU football offense. This episode is brought to you by Game Time. Buying tickets to your favorite sporting event shouldn't be stressful. Game Time is a fast and easy way to buy tickets for sports, music, comedy, and theater. If you're going up to the game in Cincinnati, don't worry if you don't have tickets yet because you can just pull out your phone the morning of on game day and you'll be able to see the pictures of the tickets. They have flash deals and last minute tickets available. You'll be able to see not just the images of the seat view, but you can go to the stadium view to be like, okay, I want to sit by the Kansas bench or I want to sit in this corner. Or I want to get this view and I can look at what the cheapest are in each of the different sections. You don't have to stress. And the game time guarantee means you'll always get the best price. If you find tickets in the same section and row for less, game time will credit you 110% of the difference. Snag the tickets without the stress with game time. Download the game time app, create an account, and use code locked on college for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code locked on college for $20 off. Download game time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Hawks to soar players we think can have good games in this one for Kansas, offense and defense. Uh, on the offensive side of the ball, Quentin Skinner slash Lawrence Arnold slash Luke Grimm. This is kind of cheating a little bit here. I'll, I'll circle it down more to a tightened answer here in a second, but uh, here's why. Cincinnati's outside corners have struggled this season. And as I talked about earlier, they have given up some big plays in the passing game. Well, Quentin Skinner's really been rolling lately. Lawrence Arnold's really been rolling lately. And then Luke Grimm had a, a great game last week, three catches for 44 he had the big deep ball down the sideline. He had the big third down conversion at the sideline. Um, if it's Jason Bean, a part of the reason I kind of did the slashy here is because we don't know who the quarterback is. 
If it's Jason Bean, I would be picking Lawrence Arnold. He's had a really good connection with him. If it's um, Cole Ballard, I would probably be picking Quentin Skinner or Luke Grimm in this one to have kind of that big game. So it kind of just depends, but I, I think you could see either one of them or both um, kind of having big games or hitting one big play down the field, and that could be the difference, right, if you get a couple of those. Uh, defense side of the ball, I'm going with Jeremy Robinson. So the Cincinnati offensive line has not graded well in pass blocking. They have graded well in run blocking. But when you look at them across the board, left tackle has been solid. Right guard has been excellent for Cincinnati. Um, and, and really a lot of the other guys have been okay, average, above average. The right tackle is the one kind of weak spot that has really struggled this year, according to Pro Football Focus. 49 overall grade on PFF. So I think they're going to put extra attention to Austin Booker and the left tackle will be dealing with Booker a little bit more. That means Jeremy Robinson has an opportunity here, and I think he can take advantage. Robinson's had a couple big games with pressures, but hasn't gotten maybe as many sacks as Austin Booker. I could see this being one of those games where he does go off and comes up with a sack, maybe a couple TFLs, and makes a big impact for KU come away with, uh, you would hope, a win in Cincinnati. That'll do it for this episode of Locked on Jayhawks. You can find our show anywhere you get any of your podcasts. You can catch up on anything that happened in the Maui Invitational. We'll be back later this weekend to recap the KU Cincinnati game. Have a great rest of your day. This has been Locked on Jayhawks.